afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. Um, I'm Rachel. I'm the uh, EA at Heart UK to the CEO. And today's webinar, we're talking about cholesterol and blood pressure. Do you know your numbers? So a really interesting topic, I think, for, to cover for today. Uh, our panel for today is Christopher Allen, who is our Head of Healthcare at Heart UK. Welcome, Chris. Thank you. Hello. And Catherine Jenner, who's the CEO of Blood Pressure UK. Welcome, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Firstly, before we kick off, um, I'm just going to pop a poll up on the screen um, just to, to, to gauge the knowledge you have of today's uh, webinar subject matter. So if you could um, pop your answers in there, that would be great. Thank you. I've got a sort of a mixture of not sure's and knowledgeables at the moment, I think, is the sort of balance on, on the poll at the moment. So hopefully by the end of the webinar, you'll all have a sort of a better understanding of, of your numbers and what we can do with them. So th thank you for voting in the poll. And um, that's great. Thank you. Um, so Chris and Catherine, could you start off by telling us a, about the basics of blood pressure and cholesterol, please? Sure. Um, so cholesterol is a, a fatty substance. We all have some of it. Um, and like with anything else, it's, it's too much is not necessarily a very good thing. So what we look for is a, a good balance with cholesterol. Because, um, you know, we do read a lot of reports that say, you know, it's good to have cholesterol. Um, but I think the message doesn't really come through sometimes that actually we do have to be careful about what those numbers are, which we are going to cover later to be a little bit more specific. Um, but essentially, you know, the role of cholesterol in the body is, is many and varied, um, which we can go into a little bit later. Um, but what we tend to see with people who have high cholesterol is sometimes they have a mixture of different factors. So it may be that they have a diet that's particularly high in saturated fat, which can cause high levels of bad cholesterol. Um, a lot of those people may be overweight or obese, for example. Um, and we usually find that these things don't come on their own. So if somebody has high cholesterol, the chances are they've got other issues too. Maybe they've got high blood pressure, maybe they're diabetic as well. Um, so it tends to come in sort of clusters um, with cardiovascular disease. And, and one of the main issues with cholesterol is when you have too much bad cholesterol, it can stick the walls of your artery and build up plaque there. Um, and that plaque is called atherosclerosis, and that can lead to heart attacks, strokes, and vascular dementia. So really serious conditions that we all want to avoid as much as possible, um, which is why we're, we're delivering webinars like this to try and help people to understand what that process is, how it works. Um, essentially, when you, you have this type of event, what can happen is the plaque in your arteries can rupture. So if you have high blood pressure, you have high cholesterol and the plaque builds up. If that plaque becomes unstable and ruptures, it's sort of like when you pop a zit and it all comes out into the artery. Um, the body sees that as some type of foreign object and a blood clot forms. Um, and can either completely block or partially block that artery. If that happens in your heart, that's a heart attack. If it happens in your brain, that's a stroke. Um, and many people who have strokes go on to develop vascular dementia. So these are really serious conditions and cholesterol is one piece of the puzzle um, to try and manage to make sure that those things don't happen. Well, here's another piece of the puzzle then, the blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> so the blood pressure is a force actually it's just the force of your blood pushing against your blood vessel walls as it flows around your body it's a perfectly natural process it's pumped rhythmically by your heart um, so it's measured in units of pressure millimeters of mercury um, and your blood pressure will be written as two numbers so you may have heard of them systolic and diastolic one is as your heart beats which pumps the blood out to the blood vessels this is the top number or the systolic and the second number is between heartbeats when the heart is filling up the bottom number with the diastolic um, so the top number the systolic is when your blood pressure is at, is at its highest because it's pumping and the bottom number diastolic is when it's at its lowest because it's relaxing it's the top one you really need to remember that's the most important one so i always remember it as systolic ceiling um, they're very variable numbers actually they can vary depending on what you've just eaten even what time of day it is how old you are um, your blood pressure can be perfectly healthy it can be a bit too low but more often it can be high which is when you are 
more at risk of health problems, which is what we're here to talk about more today. Um, much like um, high cholesterol, it has different causes. It can be the result of another illness, um, in particular kidney disease. But the type that most people, I would say more than nine in 10 people have, doesn't have a particular cause. It can come down to a number of factors, growing older probably being one of the most important ones, your genes, your family history, and if you're a black or South Asian descent as well. Um, and for the most people, even on top of this, um, it will be their lifestyle. So what you eat and what you do on a daily basis throughout your life decides what your blood pressure will be at any point in time. So if you're eating a very unhealthy, salty diet, being overweight, um, a lack of exercise, smoking, drinking heavily, all these things will raise your blood pressure numbers. And if you do less of them, it will lower it. Um, so I think we're particularly worried about sort of the links to cardiovascular disease here. So what happens is when your blood pressure's pushes with too much force against your artery walls, the walls can become damaged. Over time, the blood vessel walls become thicker, those plaque deposits that Chris was just talking about, narrowing the lining of the artery, and the space the blood has to flow through gets narrower and narrower and narrower, and blood can't flow around the body quite as easily as it should do, and the, work has, the heart has to work extra hard to force it around. Um, if it's not brought under control, which I will say it easily can be brought under control, but if it's not brought under control, it can lead to a range of problems such as poor circulation, pain in the legs, feet and chest, even heart failure. Um, blood clots can form in the arteries and become lodged, causing stro uh, strokes and heart attacks. Um, but the good news and why we're here is that blood pressure is usually, high blood pressure is usually preventable and it is very treatable. So know your num numbers, as you've said, is probably the first step on your journey. Lovely, thank you, Catherine. And there seems to be quite a lot of overlap between cholesterol and blood pressure when it comes to heart and circulatory diseases. For any of us that have had a health check or seen our GP with concerns about these conditions, are the actual numbers something we should be taking note of? Absolutely. Um, yeah, we, we do have to be really wary of the fact that, um, you know, these numbers are important. Yes, it's a big picture and there's a big piece of the puzzle to take into account. Um, but there's no doubt that we have to look at these numbers within themselves and see what we want to do about them. So, for example, as a general guide um, for people who don't have heart disease, um, you're looking at about five as an acceptable level of total cholesterol. Um, you get your total cholesterol by adding together your HDL, which is typically known as good cholesterol, and your non-HDL, which is all the different types of bad cholesterol added together, one of which is LDL, which most people have heard of. Um, depending on you know, what lab your blood goes to, it might be reported slightly differently. Um, but generally speaking, your LDL cholesterol should be below three. Um, your non-HDL should be below four. Um, so it's quite important to not just have a look at those numbers um, on their own, but to have a look at them in the context of what else is going on. So if someone's cholesterol is, is borderline, but they have absolutely no other risk factors for heart disease, that person may well be sent away and told to make some lifestyle changes um, and come back in and check in with their GP. But if they're someone who, for example, may have diabetes or may also have high blood pressure, they may be, have other um, health conditions, that may mean that medications are necessary. Um, so you can get two people with exactly the same numbers, but the treatment will be different. Um, and that's important to understand. We hear a lot through our helpline at Heart UK, um, you know, such and such body next door's cholesterol is the same as mine. They're on medication, why am I not? Um, and it's just, we, we, we can't look at things just on their own. We must look at the big picture of CBD and all the different things that feed into it. Um, we do have the, the suggested healthy breakdown of cholesterol on our website um, with the same caveat that I've given that we don't just look at it in isolation. Um, so if people have had their results through for cholesterol and don't quite understand them, um, then they can have a quick look on our website for the results on there. Um, generally speaking to if you, if you already have a diagnosis of heart disease, so you have angina, you've had a heart attack or you've had a stroke, your target cholesterol ranges are likely to be lower. And it's the same for blood pressure, which I'm sure Catherine will talk about too. But um, we would generally say a cholesterol more around the four mark um, as a total if you've had any of those issues. Um, and then coming down to HDL always needs to be either one or above, actually one for men, 1.2 for women, um, and non-HDL less than three, LDL less than two. 
um, for people who who have heart disease or other conditions like that. So it's it's it sounds quite complicated, but when you have the results in front of you and someone can explain them to you, it will make a lot more sense. And like I said, we have some information on the website where you can check against them. Um, and people can always email our helpline with their results if they're a bit confused, because obviously um, not everybody gets their results now from their GP. We post results online now. Um, sometimes you're given them by the receptionist and they're not always um, explained to you in context. So uh, do get in touch if you have your results um, and you're not sure what to do. Lovely. Thank you, Chris. Catherine? Yeah, as you said, it's part of the, these numbers are part of your overall risk profile. Um, so it's good to get a picture of your overall health and um, one or other of these things can really help you do that. Um, we, I think as you do as well, call um, high blood pressure the silent killer because it rarely has any symptoms. You simply wouldn't know that you had it unless you have your blood pressure tested. And it's thought that about 6 million people in the UK are undiagnosed. That means they have got high blood pressure, but they're not being treated for it, putting themselves at risk. And they'll only find out what their blood pressure is when they're screened maybe before a procedure, mm -hmm. um, during opportunistic screening, or even if they have a heart attack or a stroke. Um, so we're encouraging people to get it measured because that's the only way that you can then try and take some appropriate action as well. Normally it's quick, simple, well it is always quick, simple and painless, but ordinarily it's free as well. And you could just um, have your blood pressure checked at a GP with your practice nurse or at a pharmacist. It's a bit difficult to do that at the moment, um, which is why we're, we're talking particularly about home blood pressure monitoring. Um, but as Chris says, when you get your numbers, um, so, so in, in your case with blood pressure, you'd be given a systolic and a diastolic. It would be told you're something over something. You're familiar with that term, I'm sure, something over something. Um, and you'll need to look at a chart if you're not at a GP's to explain what these mean. I can't really explain it to you easy without showing you the chart. Your best thing will just be to Google blood, pr blood pressure chart and it will come up. Um, probably our blood pressure one will come up as well. But generally below, I'm just going to talk about the systolic numbers, the high number. Below 85 is considered low, which is not usually a problem, but it can make you feel faint or dizzy. Um, it can occasionally be a sign that there's something else going on. So it's probably worth a chat with your health professional if you've got other symptoms. A healthy blood pressure reading is, is below 120. A reading of between 120 and 140 is considered pre-high blood pressure. So you're okay, you're at a slight increased risk, but you might go on to develop high blood pressure if you don't keep it that level or reduce it. And then 140 over 90 or over is considered high or hypertensive. Actually at home, you're meant to have a slightly lower reading than that, five lower, so it would be 135, it will be on our website. Um, at this high level, the risks are, are notably higher, but again, as Chris says, you know, you don't panic about it. You speak to your doctor or your health care professional about your numbers um, and whether you need more tests to confirm diagnosis. And then you can look at suitable ways to lower it, such as lifestyle changes and medication. Um, and they, even if they are high, you can work with your doctor to, um, to bring it under control. So you are still in control of your health. Um, so I'll talk about home monitoring briefly. Um, just uh, brought it up now. The um, monitoring at home means that you can keep an eye on your blood pressure without actually leaving the house, which is quite handy at the moment, for, uh, <laughs> as you may have noticed. Um, it can help with early diagnosis. So you're, you're, you're only quite rarely measured in a clinic, as I say, normally if you're there for another reason as well, rather than just for blood pressure. So we don't always pick up early diagnosis. So you quite often you can just find that out at, at home. You also might want to see if your blood pressure is as high in the clinic as it really is. Um, you might have heard of a syndrome, white coat hypertension, white coat syndrome, where your blood pressure might be higher in a clinic because you're anxious about it or because you're anxious about something that you're at some other reason why you're at the doctor's as well. So it gives you a more relaxed perspective on what your blood pressure might be um, and more of a picture about it as you go about your daily life as well, because you can take it more regularly than once every you know, five years at the doctor's. You can also see for yourself how treatment is working. So if you're making lifestyle changes or a medication, it's quite a simple way to see whether they're having any effect. And also quite importantly, if there are any big changes to your, um, to your blood pressure, which need attention, you can go then straight to the doctor um, and schedule appointment as well. Um, so I should say that it's, it, it can be very useful and it's now considered to be a very important part of managing high blood pressure, but it is not necessarily for everybody. So if you have got pulse irregularities such as atrial fibrillation, AF, that can affect the accuracy of the readings. There are some machines that have been designed to overcome this, but your first step would probably to have a proper reading at a pharmacy or a GP. 
some people as well can become more anxious when they start measuring at home and end up taking readings far too often. I don't know if that sounds familiar to any of you out there. Um, but before you decide to start try measuring your blood pressure at home, you need to ask yourself, is this going to make me feel more relaxed or more worried? I would say that most people find that measuring their own blood pressure helps them feel much more in control of their condition and they feel more motivated to stick to the lifestyle changes or to any medication, which is why we recommend it. Lovely, thank you, Catherine. And that leads us nicely on to your demonstration for today. So Catherine is gonna kindly demonstrate to us how to get the most of accurate blood pressure readings at home, which is very exciting with our live demonstration today. <laughs> I'm going to be able to give you a nice clear demonstration, but the further <laughs> away from the laptop, the less you can hear me. So I'm going to sort of explain it and then give you a quick, sh a quick Lovely. show. Lovely, um, thank if you. you decide, if you do decide to measure your blood pressure at home, you'll need to get a monitor. We don't actually sell them ourselves or, or make any money from them, so I'm not going to make you a recommendation. But there are a wide number of monitors available, um, and it's important to choose the right one for you that's going to last you and be suitable for your purposes. There are so many different kinds, but you want to try and find one that's um, fully automatic. So you might be familiar with the old Figma monitor where you had to have the pump. That, that's not how it works anymore. It's a nice digital monitor. I've got a huge one with me. Uh, they're not normally as big as this. This is a clinic one. Um, I don't actually make this anymore. Normally about half the size of that, but it's digital. So all you need to do is press the button. And it comes with a upper arm cuff as well. So you can get ones that go on the wrist or the fingers, but they're not, they don't tend to be as accurate. So get one that measures your upper arm. Um, they give the most consistent results. Try and make sure you get the right cuff size as well. So most just come as a standard and a medium size. Uh, but particularly if you're thinking about sharing your monitor with other family members and friends, think about what kind of cuffs you might need. So the one, so you quite have to buy them separately. So this is a large cuff size. And it is important that it fits you correctly. But most importantly is just choose one that suits your budget. They can range between £20 and £150, depending on features like built-in memory, whether they have Bluetooth, some of these features can be helpful, um, but they're not necessary. All you really need is a clinically validated monitor, which means it's been through a series of tests. So I'll show you what it says there, clinically validated in the UK, um, and a pen and paper. We've got printouts that you can use as well to write it in, but that's really all you need to record your reading. So you want to make sure you get an accurate reading um, to give you the most sort of truthful view of your blood pressure. So take, try and take the uh, readings at the same time every day. Your blood pressure varies quite drastically throughout the day. So at least then you're comparing like with like. There are lots of things that can um, raise your blood pressure for just a short amount of time. So I would say before you measure your blood pressure, within 30 minutes, don't drink any caffeine, don't smoke. In fact, if you smoke, you should probably stop smoking. Um, don't drink alcohol, don't have a big meal, don't do it um, soon after exercise. Um, or even if you need the toilet, these things can all change your blood pressure. Try and wear loose fitting clothing, something that you can roll up to reach your upper arm or loose um, thin fabric, you can put it over the top as well. So one of the most important things, which again is something that doesn't always get to happen in clinic, is before you take your readings, you need to rest for a few minutes. You should be sitting in a nice quiet place, ideally not on a webinar with how many knows how many people are watching you? Um, <laughs> at a desk or a table with your arm resting palm up. So I'll go back and I'll reverse in a minute and show you with your palm facing up on a firm surface and your feet flat on the floor. So this is a nice time if you've got a few minutes, maybe have a little bit of a meditation or listen to a song. A pop song is about three minutes long, so that's a good chance. Um, use the same arm for readings as each arm will give you a slightly different reading. So I measure my left so I can write with my right. Um, so the monitor itself will come with instructions. So this one even has instructions on the cuff itself. So follow the instructions, but they're all fair, fairly standard. So slide it up over your arm, above your elbow. And it's got a little mark somewhere. So down, there we go. So the tube should be facing downwards, not upwards. That was, a good, that was just a little test for you. <laughs> um, you should be able to put two fingers in it. So the, the wire comes down and I've got a little green mark there. So turn your monitor on, I'm gonna reverse. Uh, 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 uh. So I've got my feet <laughs> flat on the floor, my back is supported. My arm should be at heart height, so I'm going to have to rest it. Now, one of the most important things as well is to not talk or not move. 
the machine will think it's an artery wall movement and will try and record it as a heartbeat. So I'm going to try and be calm for a moment. Press start. And the air oh. is filling up. You can describe what's happening, Chris. I was going to say, so while the cuff inflates, uh, <laughs> I just thought I'd check in and just say, um, so when you're having your blood pressure measured, if you've got a particularly chatty healthcare professional, I know Catherine and I love to chat, but you should make sure that you're not talking when you're having it done. Anything that you do, whether you wiggle in your chair or whether you speak, it changes your blood pressure. So you can see Catherine is sat nice and quietly um, <laughs> and it looks like she's done. That's very elegant, wasn't it? I'm sure you can all agree. Um, so there was a tight squeeze as the cuff inflated, but because I didn't have the, the cuff too tight, it was perfectly comfortable and it very quickly starts to deflate as well. So it's not painful at all. So it's taken my measurement now. Um, and it's giving me two sets of numbers. One is a pulse number, and there's my blood pressure. Oh, as if on as if on cue, 120, um, 120 over 73. So this has an internal printer, so I'm going to print it out. Let's not forget. That is a very healthy blood pressure. Well done, Catherine. It does look <laughs> very, <healthy>. very good. <laughs> Write it down exactly as it says on the machine if it doesn't have a memory. Now, normally your first reading will be high. It will normally be much higher than normal. I would normally just discard it straight away, but I've already done it this morning. So wait a couple of minutes and then take it again. And if it's still very high or if it's very different to your first number, wait a few more minutes and take it again. Look at your charts and see where your numbers sit. Um, write it down on paper. You might want to keep track of it, if not on the machine itself, on a computer, in an app, or one of the record cards that we've got that you can print out. Try and take it every day for about a week and at the end of the week you'll have quite a useful picture and then you just need to take it really once a month. Don't check it too often or you might become worried or stressed about really small changes uh, which can actually make it higher. Um, there in the demonstration. We've just had a comment to say that's an amazing blood pressure reading when on a Zoom call. Ah. I agree, definitely. <laughs> well done, I'm impressed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. I'm, I'm sure that's really helpful. Um, so thank you very much for doing that demonstration for us. Um, during the pandemic, more and more people are wanting to manage their health at home, I'm sure, um, you know, with, with the situation. So Chris, is, some, is that something you could possibly do with the cholesterol, your cholesterol levels as well? Um, it's possible, but ideally we wouldn't be. So sadly, I don't, I'm not going to take any blood from myself and gene my cholesterol. I don't have a demonstration <laughs> like Catherine does. Um, but it's a little bit different. So we're lucky with blood pressure that we can get people to monitor at home. And Catherine said you are more relaxed, more comfortable in your natural environment um, and you'll get some more accurate readings. Um, with cholesterol, it's different because you need a blood sample. Um, so there are cholesterol blood samples that you can take at home. Um, whether that's uh, a monitor where you do a finger prick and you put a bit of blood into a strip um, or if it's a bottle that you fill you sort of milk your finger with the blood and then send it off and um, there are various different kinds but um, generally speaking we, we wouldn't recommend using them because if it's a blood sample um, ideally it would be a healthcare professional there's lots of different factors that can influence that result that you might not be aware of that healthcare professionals will. So even down to when you've cleaned your finger, if you've not dried it properly and there's a bit of water, um, or if you're using a, a lovely expensive rich moisturiser and you prick your finger and then you give the blood, it's going to affect your results. Um, so the last thing we want is for people to act on results that aren't accurate. Um, and also you don't really get a very good explanation with those results as well. So ideally, if you're having any kind of sample like that taken, someone needs to be able to go through it with you in the context of the big picture, um, as well as going through the actual numbers. Um, results can, can vary as well. Some will just give you your total cholesterol, which actually isn't all that useful. Um, it's, it's kind of nice to know, but we do have to know how much of that total cholesterol is made up of good and bad, because like I said earlier, the advice can change according to how much of each you have. If you have quite a generous amount of good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol is borderline, your total might still be normal um, or it might be slightly higher, but you know, the advice would be different as to whether it's mostly made up of bad cholesterol. So getting that breakdown and having it explained to you is important. Um, for people who can't resist doing those tests at home, 
Um, we do have a caveat to sort of say if you've done a test at home, you really should follow that up with a, a GP or your local pharmacy. A lot of local pharmacies do um, cholesterol tests, health checks, blood pressure checks as well. You can check in with them. Um, but we have got a web page on taking cholesterol uh, measurements at home just to give you some key watch outs, just to make sure that you're, if you are going to do it, you do it as safely as possible and just some advice on what to do once your results come through. Um, and like I said, if you don't want to go to a GP surgery, you can go to a pharmacy instead and a lot of them will do those types of checks. Um, when it comes to, and, and a lot of people on here will be aware of the um, genetic element of cholesterol. There are some people who have inherited conditions, uh, genetic conditions that can change your, your lipid levels. Um, and some people will need genetic testing to look for faulty genes. This is even more of a minefield um, to, to have this done at home, um, because obviously when you have genetic testing through the NHS, you see a genetic counsellor. And they take you through very specifically what they're looking for, why they're looking for it, what it could mean for you. And they actually take a formal consent to have that test done. Um, you can't have genetic testing on the NHS unless you've consented first, because there are implications um, to having genetic conditions. It may be that it can affect different types of life insurance and getting a mortgage. And you do have to be careful when you check for these things. And that's not just cholesterol. It's across the whole of genetic conditions, including cardiovascular disease. Um, so you should always have those done with a professional. Um, there's very popular kits around at the moment where you can literally send off a saliva sample and get a genetic breakdown of all sorts of things. Um, but these are really not very helpful. And sometimes what you even find is that there are many different faulty genes that can cause a, the same condition, but they may not check for all of them. They may just check for the most common ones. So you could get a false reassurance um, or you could read something on that genetic report that, that feels quite scary. Um, and we've had people contact us before with these genetic reports and they're frightened about what they've seen. And actually in context, um, it's not that much of a concern. So we would always say genetic testing, any kind of thing like that, do it in partnership with a healthcare professional because you must understand those results well. Um, and that's kind of my, my final note on that one to say, um, hopefully uh, you will all check in with your GP if you need to. Perfect, thank you, Chris. That's some really great tips there on how best you can get your cholesterol tested. Um, obviously, up, getting an accurate reading is, is really important, so we can all manage our health properly. I think that's a really key, key point there. Catherine, do you have any other tips for people wanting to measure their blood pressure at home? Well, a couple of things. One, you might be told, in fact, I think we always used to say that you need to get your machine recalibrated after two or three years. The reality is nowadays with these digital monitors, they kind of either work or they don't work. So if it's not working, try and give it a fiddle with the wires, see if it needs new batteries. If it keeps coming up with error readings, you're probably just as well off replacing it rather than, um, rather than getting it sent back to the manufacturers where they'll charge you anyway. So we just say get a new one. Um, and it's probably also worth saying, because for part of Know Your Numbers this year, we're encouraging people not just to test their own blood pressure, but to try and encourage their friends and family as well. So we have to be very mindful about hygiene um, and making sure that the monitors are clean. We've sort of looked into it as best as we can, and it seems to be that a virus might um, be able to stay on the machines for, say, 24 hours. So if you're looking to pass it on to someone outside of your bubble, you might want to quarantine your machine. Um, an alternative could be to use a plastic bag. So as I say, it will go over thin fabric. So you can wrap, cut off the end of a plastic bag um, and use gloves, use a mask and use wipes as well. Um, there's no reason for everyone to buy a machine if they don't have to. I would say treat a, set, treat, um, treat a blood pressure monitor like you would a set of scales. Try and have it out. Anything that will stop you from relegating it in the cupboard so that you don't use it um, and, and try and make it part of your, your, your daily life. That's great. I think that's really useful in the current times with the COVID to make sure, you know, you, you, you do follow that the procedures properly to, to make sure everyone's safe. Um, so what, once you've got all your numbers, either at home or from the doctors, what, what do you do once you have your numbers? Um, so it's very much a partnership. Um, we, we get a lot of people who want to lead on their own healthcare, which is fantastic. And they want to actively work with their GP or their practice nurse, their pharmacist. Um, other people like to take a less active role. They like to sort of sit back and, and be told what they need. Um, 
but neither of those is wrong, but you have to understand what those results are. So if you don't understand what your results mean and you, they haven't been explained to you properly, ask, ask and ask again so that you understand them. Use charity services like Blood Pressure UK, Heart UK. We can help to explain those to you as well um, because the decision you make could affect your health in the long term and probably will. Um, so it's important to absolutely understand those numbers and work in partnership with your healthcare professionals. Um, some people will be told they need to make some lifestyle changes. As I said earlier, with cholesterol, it tends to be managing the amount of saturated fat that you eat can affect your levels of bad cholesterol. So it may be that you go to a quick diet sheet with somebody. And overall, um, if you need to lose weight, you may be advised to do so. Um, if you don't need to lose weight, cutting your saturated fat is still important. Um, slim people get heart disease too. That's very important to know. Um, it's not just people who are overweight and it's certainly not just men. Women are equally affected by heart disease too. So uh, don't get too comfortable, ladies. You must look after yourself um, as much as you possibly can, <coughs> says the person with the cough. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so you may then be sent away for three months. Uh, three to six months after you've been asked to make your lifestyle changes and then have your cholesterol rechecked. Um, if we see that it's come down nicely, it might be that you wait another three to six months and have it checked again as you're on the right kind of journey, or it might be that you need drugs instead. Um, the most common medications, as I'm sure you'll all know, to manage cholesterol are statins. Um, these drugs have been around for a very, very long time. They are safe to use the vast majority of people, and most people don't tend to get many side effects at all. And if they do, they're fairly mild. Um, if you do get side effects, the most important thing with any drug is not just to stop taking it and then just carry on. It should just let somebody know. It may be that the drug you're on is just not that suitable for you. You might need a milder statin. You might need a different dose. Um, once you've tried a few different things, it might be you need a different type of drug entirely. And those are available. So, you know, you're never stuck on just one medication. You must try and find something that suits you um, and achieves the, the lowering in your cholesterol that you need. Um, some people, again, as we said earlier, there are on cholesterol lowering medications like statins, even if their cholesterol is normal or borderline normal. And that may be because they've had a heart attack, they've had a stroke they have diabetes, and there's lots of evidence that says that being on these types of drugs are beneficial when you have those conditions, even if your cholesterol's normal, they'll reduce your risk of things like heart attacks and strokes. Um, statins in themselves have lots of different properties too. They can help to prevent blood clots. They can help to stabilize the plaque in your arteries. Um, so they have lots and lots of different functions. Um, the difficulty is that the, the media tends to go backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards on the drugs. Um, and it can be very confusing for people. So if you do want to talk about this issue a bit more, um, there's a lot of information on our website about those types of drugs, statins and other ones too. Um, and we have our helpline that you can email or give us a call to chat through things. And I'm sure Catherine, um, it's the same as well. You always advise them um, just to have a quick follow up if you're not sure what your blood pressure numbers mean. Yeah, that's right. It's very hard to know what they mean just from looking at them. You need to have a discussion. There's plenty on our website as well, but Generally, once you've got your numbers, you need to do something with them. Um, the best thing, if you think they're really high and they're sustained high, is to make an appointment for a GP consultation. And you will need to take action to bring it down, whether it's lifestyle or medication. Um, your doctor or nurse might prefer that you take some, make some lifestyle changes first. And actually, many of these lifestyle changes can be as powerful as taking a pill, but yeah. they're not for everyone. Whether you need to take them or not depends on your, as you've clearly said, your overall risk of heart attack, stroke and other health problems. If you have high cholesterol, if you smoke, if you have diabetes or kidney disease, even a family history of high blood pressure, uh, your doctor or nurse might decide that you need to take medicines sooner rather than later. Um, there are a wide range of medicines available for blood pressure um, and you can take more than one type because they each lower your blood pressure in a slightly different way. The types of medicines are ACE inhibitors, ARBs, calcium channel blockers and diuretics. And their effects depend on factors such as your age, your ethnic origin, your medical history, um, including even if you've taken blood pressure medicines before and have had side effects. That's one of the main reasons for people stopping taking them, whereas they can just be adjusted. Don't come off your medication. Go back and look for an alternative or an adjustment. Um, your doctor or nurse will usually go through a number of steps to make sure they find the right ones for you. And it's very important because there isn't a cure for high blood pressure. 
it means if you start taking medicines, you'll probably need to keep taking them for life. And if you stop taking them, your blood pressure will again quickly rise. Um, so we always say it's very important to really accept your medicines. You know, you weren't feeling ill before. It's a silent killer because you, you, didn't, you weren't having any symptoms. So having to take medication for something that you weren't feeling is something you have to get your mind around. But remember that um, your medicines are helping to keep your heart and blood vessels healthy because they're not doing it by themselves anymore. So accepting them is that first step. Try and learn about your medicines, read about them, ask about them. Um, try not to go onto the third and fourth page of Google. Try and sit on the first page, go to our website, um, you know, NHS, British Heart Foundation, Heart UK, try and find those ones that have got sensible evidence-based um, response. Don't just read the Daily Mail, dare I say it. Um, make them part of your routine. Um, so take them at the same time every day. You really need to get into the habit of it. So um, most people find it's easier to take them in the morning. And the blood pressure machine, again, um, it's a really good way of being able to see what effect the medicines are having. So are they actually working? And as has been said, which I'll happily talk about more, that healthy lifestyle is vital. The more you can lower your blood pressure without medicines, the less medicine you will need. And in fact, a healthy lifestyle will actually help your medicines to work better. So for blood pressure in particular, that means eating less salt, less saturated fat, more fruit and vegetables, less alcohol, trying to lose weight if you are overweight and taking exercise it, and sleep as well. Even sleep can help you lower your blood pressure, as I say, sometimes even as much as the equivalent of taking a pill. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Catherine, for that. Lots of information there from both of you. That's brilliant. Thank you. Um, so I think that's um, so thank you, Chris and Catherine. You've covered lots of really useful information there today in the webinar. So hopefully that's been of use to everybody that's um, watching today. Um, before we start questions, um, I'm just going to launch the uh, poll for the end of the webinar to see if we've had a, a, an improvement in knowledge following the, follow, following, following the webinar. So if you could all pop in your votes, that would be fabulous. Thank you very much. We've definitely lost the not sure. We've lost, we've only got 1% that's not sure now. Oh, that's excellent. Good. So that's good. So we've got 66% are knowledgeable and 30% very knowledgeable. So I think we've had a, a, an improvement on, the, on the, the poll there. That's brilliant. Thank you very much everyone for voting on that. Um, we're gonna do, we'll take some questions shortly, uh, but I'd just like to um, make you aware of some events that Heart UK and Blood Pressure UK are running in the next couple of months. Uh, Heart UK are launching the National Cholesterol Month for the month of October. All the details can be found on the Heart UK website. So if you want to get involved and, and, and get involved in that, that would be brilliant. We would really appreciate that. Blood Pressure UK are running a Know Your Numbers campaign from the 7th to the 13th of September. Again, all the information can be found on the Blood Pressure UK website. So please do get involved where you can and, and help the charities. That would be perfect. Thank you very much. Um, so I think we'll go to some questions now. So we've had a few come in. We've had a lot of questions. We've had a lot of questions. A, a, very lively, um, a very lively chat as well. So thanks for that, guys. That's great. Yeah, there's lots of chat and lots of questions. So it's brilliant. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so looking at some questions. So... Um, I've had one here, does, does lack of sleep affect blood pressure and cholesterol, particularly when it has become a ha habit, so going to bed late, etc. Does that... I guess cholesterol not so much. Um, as Catherine said before, it can have an effect on blood pressure. I'll, I'll let her talk a bit more about that. But with cholesterol, uh, no. Unless you're tying in unhealthy sleeping habits um, with a bad diet or, you know, you're, you're working shifts and you're eating at bizarre times, huge amounts of fat, it's not going to affect things too much. But there is evidence that shows or that suggests that there is a link with lack of sleep and cardiovascular disease overall. They're not sure exactly how that works yet. Um, but there's no denying that getting a good night's sleep is, is good for you in dozens and dozens of different ways. <laughs> Very important to get a good night's sleep, I think. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. It's the same. So it does have an effect on your blood pressure. We're not sure exactly how or why, but a lot of people will think of blood pressure as being caused by stress. Well, stress actually is only something that temporarily puts up your blood pressure. There is better evidence that poor sleep over a long time has got an impact on your blood pressure. So the two are obviously very, very closely related if you're stressed and not sleeping. So you need to try and find the causes of them. Um, for that, we probably direct people to the NHS. They've got some good resources on, on getting better sleep. Perfect, thank you. Um, we've had a question here. There's an, a nurse's advice that 150 over 90 is normal. Is, is that right, Catherine? What was that, sorry, 150? 150 over 90 is a normal blood pressure. Is that? It's a bit high, it's in the high range. So there may have been some variation that's been going, but you're, the, the numbers work so exponentially that the higher your blood pressure the more at risk you are so 140 is a sort of is a slightly arbitrary cutoff but 150 i would say is quite firmly in the high level so it might be something to try again at home and see if you're getting similar readings or ask to go back for another appointment i, I probably wouldn't ignore that at 150. Um, and then uh, there's been a lot of um a lot of sort of questions about eating breakfast and your blood pressure does simply not eating breakfast lower your blood pressure? I'm not sure that's a good tip, but... Yeah, only temporarily, so, so it's okay. what, you've just, what you've just eaten will have an effect on your blood pressure. So if you've had a really salty meal, it can actually put your blood pressure up temporarily. Um, but really what we're talking about is long-term changes in diet. So eating less salt today is not going to lower your blood pressure in 10 years' time. You need to be looking at reducing your salt all the time for 10 years, um, which is quite hard to do. I would say that's not an easy thing to do, reducing salt, because about three quarters of the salt we eat is in food that we already buy. So you might not even necessarily know it was in there. The best things you can do are try and read the labels. So look for the red traffic lights for saturated fat and salt, presuming most of you have got an interest in cholesterol as well, and try and look for ones that are orange or green for those. Um, but not eating breakfast, I would not say, would be a good way to manage your blood pressure. It's just about a temporary reading. That's all I was talking about. So if you're, if you're finding a, not being able to find a good time to take your blood pressure, take it another time during the day. Perfect, thank you. Um, someone has asked, how can I have low blood pressure and high cholesterol? Easily. <laughs> <laughs> um, pretty, so um, the, the two aren't tied together, although they feed into the same big picture, the two don't generally impact on the other. So as, as regards to diet, obviously being overweight or obese does impact on both of those things. But when it comes to food that you're eating, um, it tends to be more saturated fat that's an issue with cholesterol and salt that's an issue with blood pressure. Um, you're not necessarily going to have both. Um, so it, it's just one of those things that they don't come hand in hand. Catherine, have you anything to add or...? No, I think that's fair. They're both independent risk factors. Um, more often it is the other way around though. So if you have got high cholesterol or high blood pressure, um, you, you might you'd be more likely that you'd have the other condition as well. So, you know, mm. we're fortunate. Perfect, lovely. Thank you both. Um, Chris, have we got time for any more questions or? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to stay on for a little bit longer. Okay, Catherine, are you okay? <laughs> had quite a few so <laughs> <laughs> um so if, uh, there's one here um asking about uh let me just find they're pre-diabetic with slightly raised blood pressure and they've been prescribed statins but haven't taken them as they've read they might increase chance of developing diabetes is is this something that they should be worried about or there is a very small risk um, with statins that they can cause diabetes, but it's, it's very, very few and far between. Um, and if that is a concern for that person, if they're pre-diabetic, then they will be having their blood sugar levels monitored anyway. They'll be tracking HbA1c um, over a period of time. So, you know, if, if anything does start to change, then they'll keep an eye on it. But it is quite rare um, to experience that. And as we've kind of said before, with diabetes, you, your risk of heart and circulatory diseases is very high. Um, and so even if someone's cholesterol was normal, um, having them on statins is going to be a huge benefit to reducing that risk. Um, so that's why they've, they've been put on that. And, and usually, like I said, the, the targets for people who are diabetic for cholesterol are lower and it's quite difficult to achieve those levels sometimes with diet and um, exercise alone. And um, so statins can help to give that support. 
Lovely. Thank you, Chris. Catherine, anything you'd like to add? No, that says it all. Brilliant. Thank you. Lovely. Any, or would you like to do any more, Chris, or are you happy to... Well, I've seen one that someone's asked about um, 24 hour blood pressure measuring, um, which is a good question. So that is absolutely the gold standard. So a one of clinic reading is probably one of the, I'm not gonna say it's the worst way. It's still a really useful way, but that's one way. Home blood pressure monitoring is the second best, but it's called ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. 24 hour monitoring is the best way. And I say this because somebody else asked about why your blood pressure varies so much over the day. I don't know exactly why it varies so much over the day, but it does. Um, at night time, when you stand up, when you sit down, when you move around, when you eat, all different things can change your blood pressure. So this 24 hour monitoring where you will sleep with it is something that can give you a, a picture over, over a longer period of time and really alert you to, to any sort of concerning either very low or very high figures. Lovely, thank you, Catherine. Okay, I think um, that's, is everyone happy with that and no more questions? Yeah, perfect. So um, I think as I say, we've come to the end of today's um, webinar. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us and I hope that you found the information useful. If you did, um, please do, um, if you did find the information, you please look to, we would really welcome any donations to carry on these webinars, um, you know, to bring them to you and, and the vital work that our charities do, that'd be really appreciated. Apologies, we couldn't get to all the questions. We did have so many. So if, if you do want your questions answered, if it's related to cholesterol and general webinar, please contact ask at heartuk.org.uk or for blood pressure queries, contact help at bloodpressureuk.org and then they will be able to answer any of your questions that we haven't got to today. So once again, thank you. Thank you to Catherine and Chris for all your information today. It's been very useful. And thank, thank you for joining us on the webinar. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.